Hello everybody, it's Dr. Boz. We are live here on Tuesday from Tampa, Florida. I have ketones of 2.0 and glucose of 81. Today we are talking about a drug that I have seen have a powerful effect on patients, specifically their brains. And in headlines like this, where some people on Ozempic lose the desire to drink, and scientists are asking why. Well, I'll tell you, it's not the first time I've thought about what this drug is doing to the minds of my patients. Although we know that the mechanism of this drug does imp impact the brain, most of the taglines and most of the research is talking about this neuroprotection. But it isn't until recently that we've had a more thorough discussion on what it's doing to their choices and what it's doing to their long-term outcome. So, it isn't when a drug is FDA approved that I learn the most about it. It's when a patient presents using the medication and the outcomes make me, well, have a hairy eyebrow. Like, what, what are you talking about? Why is it doing that? And it isn't just one patient that's been showing up, not because I've written the prescription, but because they're on medications like Wagovi or Ozempic or Mongero all drugs that manipulate the endocrine system about feeling full or that satiety sensation while also playing a major role in what's happening in their brain. So I like to share a story of someone who's not my patient but has has a wonderful relationship with me and has, well, she's taught me a lot. Uh, her story starts out in her teenage years where at the in, at about 15 years old, she suddenly lost her mother to cancer. With three younger brothers in the family and the only female left in the family, she becomes, whether she wanted to or not, the matriarch of that family. As she leads the nurturing and the house care and the life of that home, she also needs to survive. With um, the family in shambles after mom died, uh, she was now in charge of the rearing of three, three brothers as well as her own survival. And she didn't just succeed, or she didn't just survive, she succeeded. She has a couple of superpowers where she, well, she can read a room very well. She networks in a way that uh, is just, I mean, I think I'm pretty good at reading a room or watching an unspoken language between people but she puts me to shame. She is brilliant at connecting and having difficult conversations. Uh, and the best place she put that to use has been in our country's capital of Washington, DC. So as she used her superpower throughout not only her teenage years, but in those young years um, in Washington, DC, well, she has dominated in her profession for the last 30 years. She is smart, she is driven, she is disciplined, she is uh, committed, she is faithful, she has got acts of service and kind. The one flaw that she finds in herself but also shares and asks for help with has been her struggle with weight. At one point, over 100 pounds overweight, at closing, almost reaching 150 pounds too heavy. Uh, she reaches for anything that she could to get the weight to go away whether it was Weight Watchers for a while, and then she used uh, the, the Fen Fens of the world. She then had surgeries, having a, a sleeve, and then having a complete um, uh, Ruin Y or a gastric bypass. And although those worked for a short while, they, they failed. Uh, she gained the weight back. And this story is incredibly common. So about a year ago, I had dinner with her in DC. And I was her plus one at this fancy table of people that I didn't know the names of and she was doing her thing. She was hobnobbing and so there was lots of wine and lots of food and lots of fun conversation. And for the first time in over a decade, as I sat next to her, this very lovely expensive glass of red wine did not get devoured by my friend. Maybe a sip of that red wine got consumed. And on top of that, she ordered an hors d'oeuvre, and at most, she might have licked the sauce off of that piece of shrimp. And the rest of the time, she's in her peak moment of performance. She's doing what she does. So that's stressful. In the past, it would have meant 
a bunch of wine comes with it, and as the wine would go up, her food choices would decline, and the consumption would be far more than she intended, and the perpetuation of her weight problem, despite her discipline, despite her um, other areas of incredible success, well, they failed. Uh, let me talk about why I think this is happening and what I've been curious about, and then show you a couple studies about what is this drug doing? Let's hop over to, I just want to say hello to all those regulars that put your names into the chat. Thank you, thank you. We are collecting your questions, so if you have questions about this topic, my team is watching that, those questions and we will copy those into uh, the section of the, uh, of the live where we answer some of them, or, or at least I do my best to answer them. Um, all right, let's go over here. So again, this headline isn't the first time I've thought about this. When I see headlines like this, I often think, yeah, uh, I've thought of that. And it's not the first time where my practice of internal medicine is on peak brain for performance. So yes, we know that that means your body mass index must be closer to normal. We also know that there are several other things that you should be doing uh, to have peak brain performance. And when I start to see a massive change in behavior, because of a drug like Ozempic, it makes me think, why is that happening? All right, so as I uh, uh, reverse engineer a little bit more about this DC Insider, I'm gonna also share that as a mother, when my children were developing, there are some certain parts of that brain development that are plus or minus a couple years of puberty. We know this happens, it happened to you. <laughs> and during the time of that brain development, what we're really looking for, what, what healthy parents are looking for is help them find joy in many areas because as their brain develops, that season of, of adolescence and brain development will haunt them. Uh, if we can do it well, they're gonna be addicted to the things that we help them with. And if they don't, well, we're gonna talk about that. So if you look at the healthy things, friendships happen in those adolescent years and boy, do those teenagers get pleasure out of their friends. Probably there is hardly a higher time in life that they get that joy out of friendships. Yes, sex comes with the uh, advent of sexual hormones. So going through puberty adds those sexual hormones to the body. And there are desires that happen to feel good. Uh, I wish as a mother that was, was gonna happen 10 years later, but that's when it happens. The other places for dopamine arrival include competition. Um, whether that competition is their own exercise, a, you know, a self-driven sport, or a competition sport where there's a score, or even in scholastics, whatever area of life, whether it's performance in the arts or um, the courage to get in front of uh, an audience and and you know say lovely things um, like be in a play, be in to have an oration, all of those areas of competition, especially in those teenage years, they hardwire for how you will feel joy in the future. Other places that we have this are acts of service uh, that won't start out as easy in the reward section, but acts of service become a place where when they do that in teenage years, it wires them for those acts of service years later. Uh, that is why most colleges will say, I wanna see what your philanthropy, what your time for service to others has been. It is not junk science, it's actually developmental predictions for will they want to do this in the future? Will they find the dopamine in their brain that's doing that? Storytelling is also a major part of human development for thousands of generations. We've told stories, whether it's around a campfire or in books or in um, you know, fables, this storytelling causes uh, a, an emotional response. And that also is really important for the development of a, of a healthy brain, that you get joy and pleasure out of telling, hearing, and sharing stories. But you also get joy out of eating. Uh, there's also that, well, the thrill response, the adrenaline junkies that everybody touts is a, a major part of well, they, they typically say boy brains, but it's not just boy brains, it's that we see the advent of the risk ward re, um, behaviors show up much more acutely in a boy brain usually. Um, but it's that process as a parent that you say, boy, I really hope my kids develop uh, threads in their brain that are growing in all of these areas. Uh, it isn't just that 
one area of uh, the brain, we would just want friendships. We want friendships. We do want sexual desires, competition, service. We want all of these to be developing as opposed to what happens when there is trauma in their development. And as a result, one or two of them will overdevelop. So in my friend's case, the trauma happened when her mom died and her major source of pleasure came from the processed food that was very easy for her to get on the table and was her place of enjoyment. She, although did several things like service and competition and had friends and I'm sure sex, that, that pleasure that came from uh, eating was, well, that was a number nine wire in her brain. And the rest of these were just delicate little processes that were, were almost like a spider's thread. When you look at that thrill response, whether it's from alcohol or bulimia, our brains are looking at how, uh, of whether there's a relief or a, a, a dissociation from reality. And if that's the only way they escape, this development in their brain makes a huge difference. So as I, I love this slide as it talks about where, um, where in our brains, um, you know, what, what's really happening in our brains when it comes to this neurotransmitter. All right, so this, uh, this, this, um, this section up here is a neuron that has some neurochemicals in it. I'm gonna say this one is GABA. As GABA leaves one nerve and binds to the receptor of another nerve, it sends a signal downstream that releases dopamine. Both of the GABA and the dopamine are stored in vesicles in their own neurons. And when stimulated, it's released. It binds to a receptor on the other side of that little uh, crevasse, that little synapse. And then your body recycles it. So at any point, if I would open up your brain and say, how much GABA do you have? How much dopamine do you have? You're not really losing dopamine anytime you use it in this natural way. You're recycling it so it's always present. You've always got a plump supply waiting for the stimulus to release in your, uh, in your brain. When we use external cases like, for instance, GABA can be mimicked by something that's very well known to all of us called alcohol. Now you'll notice alcohol has several different handles on there and those handles are because alcohol is kind of dirty. It, it has several um, other areas that it stimulates, but it is a fantastic dopamine stimulus, especially the first few times you drink it. In that time where alcohol is binding to the receptor, your, your GABA doesn't have a stimulus to get recycled, to get used and recycled. So as it sends out the GABA, in, a, in hopes of hand, finding a parking spot, if alcohol is always in the way, you will find a steady attrition. It will decline in the body. As you look at what happens downstream, a very similar process happens. At first, that alcohol stimulates the tar out of that dopamine and you get this super euphoria. But over time, it takes more and more alcohol to, to get that same dopamine response. There's usually a decline in the amount of dopamine that's being produced as well, as, as well as stored. So overall, the longer the dopamine was on board, or excuse me, the longer the alcohol was on board, the more times they drank, the less GABA was found in their brain and the less dopamine. This matters when they went to stop it because there, there was, a time where they said, you'll hear them say, doc, I think, I think it's, it's normal in my brain to have alcohol because I don't feel normal without it. And indeed they don't feel normal. And so, so here's a, a, a pictorial of this, uh, this alcohol uh, can mimic or look like the, the GABA, uh, uh, GABA and fit in GABA's receptor. Um, here we have opioids and uh, you'll see that mu receptor that you can stimulate that with an external source. Um, in this situation, we have acetylcholine and it is mimicked by nicotine. Here we have serotonin and you might've heard of that word with Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, but I, I'm not talking about reuptake inhibitors. I'm talking about mimickers. And so this would be an, a um, hallucinogen. Uh, when a hallucinogen mimics serotonin, um, 
it, it can cause a psychotic effect, but it's because it really does trigger downstream uh, quite, I'm gonna actually use a different color there because it's hard to see, trigger downstream quite the production of, uh, of dopamine. Um, here you've got alcohol again because it mimics um, the glutamate. Glutamate's made in this one. This is supposed to represent something like PCP or another external source for just stimulating glutamate. And finally, we have your endocannabinoid uh, uh, neurotransmitters, which are naturally made in our brain, a very important part of um, uh, endogenous euphoria, uh, which can be mimicked by THC or marijuana. Finally, over here we have, well, we have like just hardcore dopamine m mimickers, which is would be like methamphetamine. And they fit right in there and just stimulate the tar. They, they trash your brain faster than anything else, especially when you add any one of those uh, chemicals upstream and then you add the methamphetamine. The point of telling you this is each one of these has a decline in the production of their neurotransmitter the longer that external substance is used. And there is a very similar process when carbs are being used for the stimulus of dopamine. So it doesn't take long on the ketogenic diet for you to know that when you withdraw from carbs, you're kind of, it's, you feel a little solemn that you don't feel as, and you can say, oh, it's the energy because I'm not eating carbohydrates. Sure, that's true. But there's also a part of this that's linked to the brain. And when my friend was in development, she would have increased production of several of the neurotransmitters that are known to stimulate a dopamine response, a euphoric high when they burst glucose up and then it, it, it will crash, but that burst of glucose up was her brain learning to overproduce dopamine in response to carbohydrates. And the, the area of her brain that, um, that made this it became a, a highway of pleasure. It was the number one way that she used to reward herself for pleasure. And unfortunately, this sent, well, several of her endocrine markers off target. So in this slide, this is uh, an example of all of the neuro, this, this endocrine connection between your gut and your brain is not just GLP-1. It is many things. I mean, we have insulin, which I've talked about at length, several of the uh, pancreatic peptides. We have ghrelin, leptin, adiponectin, peptide YY. We have cholecystokinin, uh, oxytomodulin. I think that's like oxytocin related is what that one is. And then you have the GIP and the GLP-1. They are all an orchestrated endocrine response that does give us pleasure. And when you go through that childhood uh, development, having a, a muted uh, exposure and pleasure to several of the other neurotransmitters, uh, meaning the other ways that your brain was supposed to feel pleasure, and instead, like in my friend, a, a very stressful time where the one lane where she could depend on having high pleasure was processed carbohydrates. Um, so we've talked about this at length, what GLP-1 does. Uh, I, I'll put my head here. I think it's gonna cover, it's gonna get in the way of all those places, but <laughs> I'll put it here. Um, so we know that, what I was saying earlier, we know that the GLP-1 does increase the neural protection. We also know that it decreases gastric emptying, the amount of ways that it increases insulin, decreases glucagon, the, the production of insulin in that pancreas, as well as the lifespan of those beta cells, not just how much insulin was being put in them, but how much longer they lived and how it would put off the cell death of those beta cells, all as a cumulative effect that, guess what? You're going to have higher amounts of insulin when you stimulate it. And I've talked at length what that does for different ways the body is losing weight as opposed to what what I would ideally like it to do. This is all talking about that insulin sensitivity and is it increasing or decreasing it? Um, clearly the GLP-1s increase the insulin sensitivity despite having the increased production overall. Um, and that, uh, that liver has a decreased glucose production. You have increased glucose uptake and storage in the muscle and fat cells. And you say, well, isn't that the opposite of what you want? You're like, well, not if the total sum effect is uh, decrease in body mass. 
that cardio protection, cardio, cardiac uh, fluctuation, also very important in how we look. I love this slide showing you, okay, so I just went through a whole bunch of endocrine things that tell you, hey, we make a huge uh, impact on the body as food travels through your gut. We notice that it's, um, it is ghrelin that's made in the upper stomach area. We know that it's the um, cholecystokinin that's made in the, you know, right after that, uh, in the duodenum, the first part of that small intestine. You have GIP and GLP-1 uh, made in, I better turn this to white, made in your, um, your small intestine and the first part of that large intestine. And this is what uh, Ozempic is. Ozempic is the, is the GLP-1, um, but your Mongero is your uh, GIP plus GLP-1. What I'm, you probably don't care, but uh, what you should care that it's an endocrine response. It's coming from the gut and it highly impacts how your brain works and how you think. All right, so let's just make sure you, I, I like the anatomy lessons here, so just hang with me. So as I look at uh, why we care about um, the food consumption and what it's doing, we know that, uh, and I've talked at length how important it is that during mastication, the chewing of your food, the first enzymes uh, enter into your circulation and start to impact what your body is doing. Oh boy, crashed my thing here. Uh, what your body is doing uh, for the improvement of not just GLP-1, not just satiety, but how that movement of food throughout your GI system is linked to whether or not you'll eat in the next hour. So I skipped a few slides which say, when we look at what's happening inside our gut, um, I, I think people skip that when, you, when food enters that stomach, it changes uh, because of these endocrine processes. As it gets into the first section of the GI system, it stimulates the production of several hormones. When it travels into this section right here, I think we are um, uh, trying to demonstrate the... Um, I think this one is the large intestines. Yeah, so this is uh, this is the section where uh, the two slides ago it was the small intestines, but I didn't get to show you that. In the small intestine, your body is absorbing the nutrients. And that mucosal layer, that place where the slime layer that you can see right here, uh, now that I got my bearings back, this section right here, uh, the thickness of that will help your body either absorb the nutrients in an accurate and very precise way, very efficient way. Um, and the more damage that mucosal layer gets, the worse that absorption process is in your small intestine. It's this next section that really has to do with GLP-1 and these other endocrine processes. By now, we're in the colon. We've left the small intestine, your little appendix, the appendix is right behind you. And that this is in that large intestine where the parts we have left, this little green guy here is supposed to represent the bacteria. This is where you are no longer in the sterile section of the gut, you are in the bacterial section of the gut. Um, I draw these purple things because we don't often talk about this on, on this channel. These are part of the polyphenols, frequently found in your, um, in your vegetables. I'll tell you, I don't get them by vegetables. I get them by um, something that's on my Dr. Bob's favorites fa page, which are you know, cold-pressed algae. And when I look at cold-pressed algae, it is... Um, it is because I know this chemical reaction is about to happen. The third thing that I left in the GI system was those little, ye those little yellow things that look like french fries. They're not french fries, they're not carbohydrates. They're strings of fat, specifically the kind of fat that is butyrate. So, oh yeah, I did blow those up for you. <laughs> so you've got, you've got um, bacteria, you've got polyphenols and fat. And that, uh, the combination, those trifecta, well, they lead to a stimulus that that your body is depending on and so is your endocrine system. All right, let's go back here and watch what happens next. Okay, so this uh, flesh colored uh, uh, cell right there is called, it's an L cell, just the letter L, and it specifically mm, produces um, GLP-1. It does that and by combining that bacteria, the specific fat called butyrate and some polyphenols, the, there's a, actually a special kind of bacteria that you need to do that. 
and it will stimulate the production of GLP-1 in that uh, cell. Once it makes that endocrine uh, hormone, it then sends it into the circulation and you will find it in your brain. Um, you will find it rising and falling um, about, um, about um, 15 to 20 minutes after you eat. And if you've ever heard a doctor say, just eat slower, <laughs> just uh, wait for that, you'll have a response of fullness if you can just slow down your eating. Well, that is true in healthy people. But if you ask my friend how many times that she has tried to eat even slower and slower and slower and slower, that I talk about this dinner time where alcohol is involved with uh, her food choices, but that's not the norm. Those are definitely pockets in her, you know, in her pattern of eating that she knew she had to work on. She knew it was problems, but uh, you know, that ability to course correct was also in a setting where she couldn't feel good. And when I asked her to, a year ago, well, you know, she had lost a few pounds at that time, but she said the, the most impressive, well, first of all, afterwards I said, what the heck? That whole meal, that like three and a half hour gorgeous demonstration of food and dine and people and stress. Again, she's in her peak performance moment. She had like, I mean, a bite at most. Like how? She's like, you can't believe how much this stops me from eating that when, when her uh, GLP-1 in the past would have been maybe just a blip on the radar. I don't know if it's because of the mucosal dysfunction in her. I don't know if it's because uh, the butyrate is not, um, um, she wasn't, you know, she, she had plenty of butyrates in all kinds of fats. You can make it from other fats, but you can really make it, you really find it in butter. So I, she had plenty of butter, so that, that wouldn't be it. But maybe her, maybe the type of bacteria that does, is needed for that um, stimulus of GLP-1, maybe she didn't make that. But whatever it was, she, she found a massive change in her ability to say, no, I'm, I'm fine and I feel good. So when, when we inject um, Ozempic into patients, if you look at, uh, if this is zero, uh, the, the time when you eat, let's do that in white. If this is zero, and this is the uh, 30 minute mark, and this is the 60 minute mark. What you see Ozempic do in normal healthy people is, or not Ozempic, GLP-1, sorry, uh, is it'll be at your baseline, um, and after eating, it's about 15 minutes that it starts to rise, and then it comes back down. Now, if you look at what's happening in most people like my friend, I mean, it's almost like off the radar, and they might get a little blip there they just don't make it. When you add Ozempic to their, you know, to their injection site, I mean, it is, you know, 30 to 100 times higher because, I mean, well, if it's zero, it's like an infinite number of times higher, but it is so much higher than anything else their body has seen that, well, they are no longer depleted in that section again. As I look at, um, Another uh, study that was out there, this is one of the studies when I, when I started to get curious, why is, it, is this happening in more than, it wasn't just this patient, there are several patients that have this story and they are particularly, um, well, there's a particular pattern. Their, their childhood trauma is real. Uh, and I don't just mean like today's trauma that it, it, they're, they're being therapized for way too many problems that aren't real, real problems. These are real issues, not the trauma that your dog died when you were 15, but real, nobody's there to raise you anymore, that's trauma. And as she didn't end up on an antidepressant or anything like that, she, she coped with carbohydrates and she wired her brain in a way that I'm not sure, with all the resources in her, in her, in her body, that she could undo. Let me show you this. Here's a, the, a, a mouse study. I think this was 2006, if you look, oh, 2013. Um, so if you look down here, you can see the resource of where that's at, hold on. So in this mouse study, they're looking at the nucleus accumbens. That is an area in the very you know, primitive part of your brain that is linked to dopamine production. It is particularly hot on a functional MRI when you have had cocaine. So they took mice and they had four um, sections that they were looking at. Uh, they had this carrier that was, in th that was um, carrying a a drug like GLP-1 into the mouse. 
Um, they have the control. I think uh, the time they ate is like right here, somewhere like right there. And when you look at what was the response, did the, did the, um, did the dopamine release uh, happen in this nucleus accumbens? The answer was nothing in the control, nothing from GLP-1. They, they just didn't have a response. When you added cocaine, <laughs> and this is just in the, the normal mice that didn't have any, any, um, any uh, GLP-1 in there, it, it peaks. It is not a, a subtle response. But if you put uh, GLP-1 in the mouse and then gave them the cocaine, so this is GLP-1 plus cocaine, you see a striking decle decrease in the amount of uh, dopamine released from their brain. And it is, it is, there are several of these studies that are looking at what is the difference between a brain that um, has been coping with life, finding pleasure in food, to a pathologic level, to a place where not only is their brain, um, I mean, it is hardwired to want pleasure from food. Um, and, and maybe they've coupled alcohol with it. Maybe they have a few other habits that are gone with it. But I mean, my friend, uh, you, you'll hear this if you've listened to Oprah's response too. Uh, th their ability to say yes to food um, is, I mean, they have that. But they also have the resources where they've said, I have tried. I, and my friend would say, I can have somebody handcuff me <laughs> to the treadmill. And I have done it for days and hours and life filled with this exercise plan and I'm still not losing weight. And I can tell you that there's a whole bunch of endocrine reasons why she probably isn't losing weight. But there is also some hardwired desire parts that I wonder if it's even possible to unprogram that. I mean, when I look at other places that I learned this from, let me see, um, let me show you this, uh, that it is, um, I mean, there have been places where when we look at GLP-1, when we look at hormones and we decrease the pleasure people feel, what are the consequences? This is an older study, but um, looked at, uh, this was the name of the chemical and this is the name of the company, but it was um, an anti-obesity. It caused anorectic, I mean, it caused them to not want to eat. And approved in 2006 in Europe, but uh, withdrawn from the worldwide place because of serious psychotic side effects. Uh, it never got approved in the United States. But it's stories like that where you say, yeah, do I have patients in my, you know, my clinic is filled with internal medicine but peak brain performance. And you might think that that is, you might think that's boring. It's not boring. Uh, but there are brains that are broken for many reasons. And one of the common places that it's broken is because of addiction. So as I would be trying to help brains, you know, uncouple from addiction, one of the drugs that we used was Vivitrol. So Vivitrol hit the market um, and there was, <laughs> actually this was a DC decision where the, the lobbyists in DC that were for methadone did a way better job of marketing their drug as opposed to what happened with naltrexone, which is, the injectable version of that is called Vivitrol. Now the studies are clear that Vivitrol should have won. Vivitrol was the drug that put a force field around that receptor, that, that dopamine receptor that is triggered when alcohol was consumed. Um, now it had, a, uh, if you think of that force field as like an umbrella with a stick down the middle, it would tickle that receptor so that you, it would have less withdrawal but it was clearly the better way where it stopped them from getting the pleasure, the excited and overproduced pleasure from consuming uh, alcohol. Um, it, it works for opiates as well. Well, methadone was the drug of choice and the lobbyists made sure that it was on the front, sign, front, front of everybody's prescribing behavior. Uh, and up popped all these methadone clinics throughout the country. But if you look at the psychology or, or the neuro, uh, neurochemistry of what it was doing, methadone is a long acting agonist. So it goes in and it parks in that receptor of the opioid. So they still, they cannot downregulate any of the pathology. What, where with Vivitrol they could. So Vivitrol was something that I would use. And if I would give this alcoholic, I mean, it's a thousand dollars a shot I would say instead of spending $50,000 on Betty Ford and your kid's gonna be out of there in 45 days without any 
real transformation. I mean, yes, you'll be detoxed, and yes, the family gets a break from an alcoholic, and Betty Ford does lots of great things. I'm not naysaying that. But might it be better to use your resources for paying for this $1,000 shot for 18 months? So that for the next 18 months, your kid will not get high off of opiates, your kid will not get high off of alcohol. And if I would only give them the drug, as soon as the drug, I mean, if that's all they were doing, we were you know, trying to get them to, to, to network into those other areas of the brain that, that really did play out um, and improve the, their, their life. I mean, that, they ha that number nine wire that was in their brain that says they got high from alcohol, they got high from opiates, they learned this usually in that developmental years of their brain, in those you know, late teens, early 20s, where they are over, just overly addicted to this pleasure center and they, and they don't get pleasure from friendships or service or stories or all the other things that their brain should have developed. By covering up the, the, the part where they were getting super rewarded from uh, opiates or alcohol, we wanted them to develop those other relationships. And we did all kinds of things to try and help them to do that. But you can't, you can lead a horse to water. Some of them just wouldn't do it. And by golly, as soon as that shot was off, they would go back to their drug and they would relapse. And so you look at a drug like Ozempic and say, well, I, I um, I have a couple more slides here that I, I think I just want to make sure. So Vivitrol, we actually looked at, would it inhibit a runner's high? And the truth is it didn't do anything to a runner's high because it wasn't a clear connection. Uh, but it's not the first time where we say, gosh, we can really manipulate those receptors of the brain. Is it going to ruin how they feel pleasure normally? And as I look at, um, as I look at my friend who, who, I mean, it's such a pleasure to hear her joy where she's now been on the, this medication for about 18 months and she's like, I cannot believe how happy I am. I cannot believe the joy I have in my life. And again, she has acts of service. She does philanthropy. She is, a, she, she is an incredible human being, very successful. So she has the resources where she can be on this medication forever. And with all of the other all you know nightmares she's done to her body in hopes to lose the weight in hopes to be the patient who is not at risk for heart disease I mean with her mother dying suddenly of cancer she's always been worried that was gonna be her demise and you look at you know what would I be telling her uh, well I'd want your body weight down I want your insulin to be lower I'd want you to be exercising I'd want you to be sleeping well you know all of those things um, well, they were all the things that, yes, she was struggling with, working on, but struggling with. And even in her most disciplined seasons, where it would be, um, you know, three accountability coach, any way to keep her on the straight and narrow, she would follow the rules. Her ability to feel joy was absent. And as you interview her, along with several others that are using a medication like GLP-1, like Wagovi and Ozempic, I, I've questioned would I ever write it as a prescription? And I, I, I know that I've said, boy, I would never do that. Um, so let me tell you some of the things I would consider and then I'll tell you the answer and we'll go to your questions. Um, uh, let's go back to those slides We're right here. So can you ever get off of it would be the question. Um, so here's a couple little facts about these drugs. They have a long half-life that it's about five weeks um, to exit the the delivery um, once you stop them and I I've had other clinicians talk about how they will use the drug uh, at a much lower rate than what it's prescribed in hopes to say we're helping them without I mean just pummeling this hormone to a hundred times physiologic levels I don't know if I would do that. I, I think that's an opportunity. I also wonder if my friend would have found benefit. Um, I think, like I said earlier, there's a pattern to the people who are finding pleasure uh, in, in this prescription medication. And um, here, if it was my sister and she was 100 pounds overweight and, then, and knowing that weight loss is really going to help her, I would start with a ketogenic state, knowing that that gut mucosa 
where GLP-1 is made, you have to have this hearty gut mucosa in order to replicate this hormone. It's one of many hormones. We know that in a highly inflamed or malnourished, despite obesity, that malnourishment leads to the decreased production of several of those endocrine hormones. So I would ask her to be in a ketogenic state and I would want it for not only her mucosal repair, that gut lining repair, but also knowing that her brain would be better on that higher state of ketosis. Um, I would make sure she's taking in polyphenols, not something I talk about uh, much on this channel, but is something that, again, patients have taught me more than I, than I started out knowing, obviously. Um, but polyphenols are found in vegetables, and well, I don't eat vegetables, but I do use my, I use that, if you go to my Dr. Bob's Favorites page, um, you can find that um, it's not just a, um, let me do this, go to website. Uh, yeah, if, if you go to this Dr. Bob's Favorites page, um, you can see that, uh, you go here, you go. Uh, I have several things on here that not only help support our channel, but this is where you're gonna see what it is that I do. I wear a CGM all the time. I'm speaking in Cairo. I leave on Friday to go to Rome for a week. So you check in next week if, if everything works out. I'll be live from Rome. Um, and the following week, I'll be live from Egypt. Uh, um, and here is uh, something called Pendulum. This is the only uh, antibiotic or probiotic that I've ever put my name behind. It's insanely expensive. Please use the promo code for a discount but those are the special kind of bacteria that are needed at the first section of that small intestine and in the last part of your, or the first section of the large intestine, the last section of your small intestine to make GLP-1. That is what's needed. I, I would make sure my sister has that. Um, and I would, um, I would send her to get polyphenols this way. I, I like the green ones better. Uh, I think that they are, they're just, that's the ones I like better, but both of them work. Um, these are supposed to have higher energy, but it's this, um, this energy bit that I think that's where I get my polyphenols from. So as I look at um, what I would do with my sister, I would make sure she has polyphenols and I would replace that anaerobic bacteria. That's that, um, that very expensive probiotic. Um, and there's a whole bunch of information behind that that um, I, we are getting to, it's, it's it keeps getting punted down the list, but it's, it's a, it's a great, it's a great education point. Um, the, the last thing that I, I would point out is in my patient, in, in my friend who had added Ozempic, um, I would, I would make sure that it, which she already had, which is the part that brings me, you know, it's really easy to be a purist. Um, I would want to make sure that my friend is, uh, you know, her life is filled with friendship, <laughs> that there's competition and then there's the way she competes. She has conquered her industry in DC and she is a powerful, smart, intelligent woman who's very disciplined, that she gets lots of pleasure out of winning. <laughs> um, I hope she has sex. Um, she has lots of service. She is, uh, she is the art of storytelling. It's the eating that she has overused in her life and in order to suppress that dopamine and grow the other parts, um, I wonder if she, I wonder if she could ever stop it. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't want to know the answer to that. I know that without um, this medication, she wouldn't have lost. I mean, I think when she said last year she was about, you know, 225 pounds, and now she's down to 175. So she's not Barbie doll. She's just normal and she exercises twice a week or three times a week and says, but now I like it. I, I feel joy. I've never felt pleasure in doing those things before. And I contend that I wonder if she wasn't able to develop those other dopamine um, avenues until she stopped tickling the dopamine number nine wire linked to food reward in her own brain. And it's because of that that I say, I prescribe it, especially in stories like that, uh, that the medication might be better than keto. And I know that people have uh, chirped at me and I usually see comments saying, you change your mind, you change your mind. And I'm like, I would be worried 
if scientists didn't change their mind. If they came up with a plan and forever for the rest of their life that was the only plan that worked. I would say that that's the danger that you can chirp at me for changing or my mind and I, I think that's part of science is that you have a theory, you, you carry on with it, but you continue to question it and wonder what is the benefit, what is the risks, and where does it fit into the population. All right, so it is, uh, let's get to your questions here. Those have been, that was a longer uh, link of um, recording than I thought it would be, but uh, I'm not recording a, of um, uh, slide deck, I guess is the right answer. Thanks for sticking in there for that little hiccup where it, it crashed. Um, all right, let's start with Lisa Case. Let me take this a little bit down. Lisa Case, how do you get off these drugs without rebound? Or do you have to stay on them forever? Same with the trauma response and turned to food, alcohol, cigarettes, but uh, was much older, 36, would I benefit? You know, Lisa, it's exactly who I'm talking about, that I don't think, um, I don't think nobody, uh, I mean, I don't think that you can say with certainty that you wouldn't benefit. Um, your trauma and your coping skill. I mean, I talk about the teenage brain because those were most of, most people find the trauma associated with that part of the development. So it doesn't mean at 36 it was nothing. I'll, I will tell you it's much easier to fix when they, when they're, when their life events happen after that full maturity of their brain. And they have the foundation, if they have the foundation of a stable family, parents who had rules, uh, um, people that loved them that were beyond their family, that family should love them, but you should have a community that's loving you. Those are the signals of a very solid foundation for dealing with life, because it's never gonna be perfect, but it will, um, it will stop um, the, um, it will stop the 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 uh, progress when 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 the trauma is terrible. So, would you benefit from the um, from that? I, I would I would I would have that discussion with your doctor. I think there's way more to this than what I was willing to talk about when I first reviewed this. Um, the other part of that that I I'm curious about, and I, I don't pretend to know the answers, um, is how do you get off of it? Um, so this is where I've had other clinicians talk about what they are doing. And um, usually they get the patient to the ideal weight. They, they keep the medication on at the highest doses to get them to the ideal weight. Because my friend, she has risk for heart disease. She was too heavy, period. She knew it, She's, she wanted it off. She, if Will was the reason weight came off, she would have won lo a long time ago. If it was you know, mental determination, she would have been there. But there's more to this than that. And it's not everybody. Not everybody should be on this. I mean, I think everybody is on this where, I, I mean, everywhere I turn, people are like, how'd you get the weight off? Oh, Zen Pico. So it is helping a lot of people with their coping skills of not using food to cope. Okay, well, uh, but then to stop it, um, you know, I've seen people do a taper and then try to extend the time between shots. That's been one, it's off label, uh, but it's something that folks are doing. And then they'll get to the point where they use the medication one week and they're off for three to four weeks before the next shot. So they extend time in between shots. And what they're reminded of is that's what it feels like when somebody else suppresses the appetite. Um, what does it look like when, when you're in charge of it? So I would, boy, I'd love to, if you'd, I'd love feedback if, if you end up on it and um, on how it works. Um, let me do one little thing here I was trying to do. Let's go to, um, hold on here. So what is this? Uh, screen capture, Just one second here. Here we go. That's what I want. Here we go, it's centered now. <laughs> Yes, it makes me feel better. Okay, uh, Think For Yourself writes in and says, I can't seem to stay in ketosis without fasting. And then when I break my fast, my glucose goes above 100. I'm following all the rules and I've been keto for a few years. <laughs> what gives? Yeah, that's insulin resistance for you. Um, it's, it's real uh, that um, I, I, I see this a lot. Um, I will tell you that um, 
the breaking of fat, the, the time between sunrise, which, you know, where, where when, uh, so think for yourself, if you can write in and tell us whether or not you're on a CGM, if you've, if you've used a, a continuous glucose monitor. Because, or I cracked the code in somebody whose glucoses are high. And first of all, congratulations for staying keto for this long. Um, there are lots of things going right in a state of ketosis. Uh, I continue to fast every week, not just because it's, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, badge of honor <laughs> on Tuesdays where what is my glucose and ketones, but because I know what it's doing to my brain, I know what it's doing to my system. And I've had this love of food as well. I do much better with zero than I do with eating. And now it's better. Each year I get better at this. And I think uh, probably a testimony to you guys showing up that I continue to talk about it, teach about it, and live it. And then, you know, habit stack. I get a little better each year. But when I see somebody who's been doing this a while and their morning glucoses are high, I would highly recommend that you wear a CGM. You will be fascinated with what's happening during your sleep. In folks who have a high morning fasting glucose, they make, they make cortisol more than they think they do. Whether it's poor sleep, whether it's um, you know, stimulus of, uh, of stress that they're not, that they just think is normal, and their body is living under this higher amount of chronic stress. Uh, and when they can see it, it's, it's fascinating. Like, what's happening here? What's happening here? But without seeing a continuous glucose monitor, I can't get it. It's somebody else. Uh, you know, I'm saying this now and people are thinking, oh, that's not me. I don't have that problem. And I'm like, it, it's fascinating how many people look in the mirror saying, oh my God, I think she's talking to me. <laughs> I didn't want her to talk to me. That's someone else's problem. I'm fine. I can handle the stress. I've been sleeping five hours a night for 20 years. I'm fine. You're human. It's going to catch up with you. Stop doing that. <laughs> so, I don't know if I answered your question, but I would love to see if you have, if they, if I'm, I'm watching the chat off to the side as well. So if you type it in, I'll see that it's you and see also, do you think you've ever worn a CGM? Because if you haven't, I would highly recommend you get one. You will learn a ton. Um, all right, going to the next question. Uh, A.W. says, I've gained weight even doing fasting and keto. Why? Again, um, it's not that you don't. I mean, when patients are on a ketogenic diet, we, they can't lose weight. If they're insulin resistant, they cannot lose weight until they fix the chemistry. And once they fix the chemistry, the next parts are you now have a primed metabolism you still have to use it. You still have to flex it. It's just that your efforts before were muted. They, they didn't result in the weight loss because you cannot out-exercise the chemistry. And when insulin resistance, when, and you've been priming that body filled with insulin, filled with glucose, and you have every, you have the earwax in each ear filled with sugar from the excess sugar over the last 40 years, and then they go keto and say, all right, why isn't it just falling off? Well, you, you still have to flex the metabolism. So one of my favorite ways to flex metabolism for me was to fast. That's something I was totally against at the beginning and now it's just the easiest thing for me to control. Over the years, I've added things like a sauna. It's where my husband and I have a date. <laughs> it's we go to the sauna. We are those kind of old people. <laughs> And, um, and I still work out, exercise is important, but I didn't grow up loving exercise. Uh, it's a chore for me and <laughs> I, I'm not taking Ozempic or any other GLP-1, but I still don't love it. I have to couple it with something that is true to my soul. So I've had these three sons and the final one is graduating from high school in the next month. And for nearly a decade, I have coupled my exercise to being the one who imprinted exercise on my sons. So the reason I would exercise is to fill that, that altruism, that acts of service, that mothering role with that. So that's why I exercise. That was the joy. I didn't get joy of doing it. I got joy of being there with them, of doing it with them, or having, they have to see somebody that they have a role model for uh, do it in order for their brain to have that wiring as a joyful place in their life. And knowing that, I'm like, well, they're not gonna get it from dad. <laughs> They'll get sauna from dad. They will not get exercise from dad. I don't know. So it, again, I grew up on a farm where you work and work should make you sweat, but 
Um, so when I see people doing weight gain or having weight that is gained during a ketogenic state, I say, prove that you've got good glucose in the morning, prove that you've got good ketones in the morning, measure those numbers first thing in the morning. I would also do a little detective work and go over to the Dr. Boss Favorites page and order one of those CGMs. A CGM helps you study you and you don't need a, you don't need a doctor to get involved with it all. You are going to see your sugars and say, WTF, why is it doing that? Why is my sugar high? I am perfectly fine. <laughs> And you'll start to notice that those chronic stresses are doing way more to prevent you from losing weight than you think it is. Once you're in a ketogenic state, you have, your efforts are going to be rewarded, but you still have to have the efforts. And that's what I, that's what I usually see in people who are, so when, when I hear the word fasting, I want to know you're getting past 48 hours. I mean, 36 hours is the minimum it takes for insulin resistance. And when people are fasting, I want to know, have they reached that goal of the 72 hour fast? Uh, eight consecutive weeks in a row. It is a badge of honor. It is something on this channel that I say when they have reached that, it is a different landscape of weight loss for them. So I would, I would noodle back with those questions. Michael writes in <laughs> and says, uh, how's your knee? Oh, thank you for asking. Well, I will tell you that I did not get an MRI. Um, I am still, <laughs> I had my, I had the brace on. Uh, I did a really good job last week of MCTing and doing all the stuff and it felt good. In fact, I had the folks across the hall who are, well, they're Tom Brady's old team. <laughs> so Tom Brady doesn't play football anymore, but his team of, um, well, they're called, they used to be called TB12. Now they're called TBRX. Total body recovery is what that stands for. But so I had the folks, uh, you know, because we've known each other now for three years since I've been working here. I had him come examine my knee. And I, 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 I thought that it was not the ligament. Like this could be an MCL because it, that's where it hurts. And dang, did I, did my knee bend the wrong way? So it should have been an MCL, but the pain was higher than it should have been. And, you know, you can't, I couldn't examine myself, but so the guy from TV 12 comes over, Kevin came over and he, he examined my knee saying, yeah, it is a solid knee, meaning it's not a ligament. It's not the laxity, the elasticity in your knee is not abnormal. It's, it's tight. It's normal, but the pain was outrageous. So, uh, which is what I thought, but I, I needed somebody to confirm it. So. I did great when I was doing MCT and I got in the tube and then over the weekend I had kids home for Easter and I, I didn't have as much, I, I ran out of the MCT at home and I didn't go back to the office and get some so I wasn't pushing my ketones as high. I didn't sleep in the tube because that's where the kids sleep in their home, I mean in that room uh, and so I went backwards. <laughs> so Monday it was awful and today I'm definitely sleeping in the tube tonight. I have four days left before I go to Egypt. Uh, or to Rome and then to Egypt, and they do not have a wheelchair ramp in the pyramids, and I am going in the pyramids, but it is a stiff bugger of a knee, first thing. So I, I, I think it's a muscle tear. A bruise showed up at about five days after the injury, and um, anyway, so it's, I'm going to will it better. <laughs> I don't think it's a ligament. I think it's a muscle tear, and I'm, I'm gonna be better by Friday. <laughs> but thank you for asking, Michael. Um, all right, Susan writes in and says, I lost five pounds since January. I got a CGM for about five days, uh, pretty much runs 100 around the clock. Fasting blood sugars between 97 and 110. Went up to 116 today before I even ate. Seems abnormal, right? Yeah, that's insulin resistance. Susan, this is what it looks like when people have, when people are pre-insulin or excuse me, pre-diabetic. When their sugar, their sugars are, they're going to their doctor and their doctor's like, ah, your fasting sugar's fine. But when you're studying it, you're like, yeah, your fasting sugar should be, I mean, my fasting sugar should be 75 to 85. Um, and then throughout the day, it can go up. If I eat too late at night, if I have um, wine too late at night, that doesn't go over well. Um, the, sh the morning sugars, uh, they're probably not 100, but they get into the 90s when I do those naughty things. When I eat clean and I do not eat after the sun goes, uh, sun goes to sleep, um, my morning sugars are, are down in that 75 to 85 range. 
And when you start, start to see people's blood sugars trickle up into the hundred, the hundred and then the hundred and sixty, boy, that is insulin resistance. And that is what I wrote that book for, Keto Continuum. So if you don't have the workbook, if you would not, have not started this, you might have to advance up to Keto Continuum number four is probably where you're going to be at if you've been watching the show. But if not, it gets you to Keto Continuum number four within a few steps. Uh, and then you need to get to that ultimate badge of honor, which is the eight consecutive weeks of 72 hour fasting. And you cannot believe what that reverses. It's hard. I will contend people don't get there without a support group. They need a buddy. They need a accountability partner. They need somebody else watching them. This is the kind of groups that we make and we say, we gift it to the people in the 21 day. At the end of the 21 day, you're in a group. You're all trained, you all know how to, and you've got each other's blood sugars you're watching. And that accountability is the only way we've seen people transcend out of a metabolic disaster. Um, so I, I, you're right. Good job for looking at your CGM and studying yourself. Uh, great question. Last question, then we'll go. Um, so Zulu writes in and said, would you still recommend a full carnivore animal base for an 80 year old lady with a new pacemaker? I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to take out grandma. <laughs> Thanks Boz, you rock. Uh, so Zulu, I would recommend that for an 80 year old. What I would be careful of is that you are getting enough protein. That um, insulin resistance and high amounts of protein can be a bit of a, a sabotage. I've, had, I've seen people eat way too much protein at the beginning and not, um, not be able to get out of that insulin resistance. But if you're talking full carnivore and you're, you're I mean, obviously you've probably been doing some of this before now, um, I would recommend that, um, uh, I mean, I think that the healthiest people in their 80s are the, the ladies who are carnivore, uh, who, I mean, maybe they have algae bits. Don't forget these things. I, I can't tell you how many problems these fix. Um, they're expensive, I know, but, uh, and I've tried to look into like making them, but I can't get them for much cheaper than what she's doing and I don't wanna, I don't wanna enter into that space. Uh, when the, the other algaes that are out there, that, the reason why I have this one on there and it's super expensive, I know, but it's not heated. So the polyphenols are preserved because it's cold pressed. That's, that's what I would sell if I was making it for myself. So that might be the only place that I would ask an 80 year old to, um, to double check is make sure that they're getting enough protein, that um, the carnivore diet is, um, it's got flaws, but if you read the keto continuum and you use carnivore with keto continuum, you'll get there. Meaning, where do I see the people make the mistake is if they're insulin resistant. If it's that gal, the one Zulu, no, the one right before that, uh, and, and you look at uh, what happens when blood sugars are 110 when they're starting, and then they do carnivore, they, and they don't have the, the outcomes that Sean Baker does. Well, Sean Baker doesn't have insulin resistance uh, like most of the people watching the show do. Um, he might have in a past time, but his muscle mass has created a chemistry set that does not have insulin resistance anymore. Um, most 80 year olds have insulin resistance. So if they eat 15 small meals a day, eh, you know, that's exaggerating, but even if they eat five small meals a day, they are stimulating insulin way more than they should be. And they don't lose the weight and that's who gets stuck. So if you take carnivore and you lay it on top of the keto continuum, which is the timing matters, checking your sugars and your ketones is an easy way for you to be able to say, hey, I'm doing this right. And um, you're not the first person uh, to, um, to write in, I mean, I, I hope you succeed on there. The, the downsides are don't have multiple meals per day and you wanna make sure you're getting enough protein after you know that your blood sugars are down. <laughs> so that's a two-step answer. I'm gonna check my ketones at the end of this. We'll see what I get. Uh, I do have a, I noticed the, um, somebody wrote in and said, what's the difference between the GLP-1 probiotic and acromancia? Well, acromancia is part of that um, compilation that's in that glucose control on the Dr. Bob's favorites, but it is in the milieu, if you would, uh, of the bacteria, so 2.4 on ketones and glucose is 84. So my glucose went up a little bit, probably the stress of crashing my slides there, huh? 
Um, but the, the acromancia is just that anaerobe. And um, when you look at the studies on who had a better reduction of glucose, who had a better suppression of uh, appetite, who had a better spike in GLP-1, all of those were better when you had this, uh, it, it's, it's actually a dirtier version. It's not just pure acromancia. It's a compilation of several of those bacteria along with, um, um, there's a, a couple of things in there that help those bacteria grow better. So uh, I followed the study. That's why I, that's what I would, that's what I took when I was testing it. Uh, I, I'm almost out of it, so I have to order it again. It's like 500 bucks for three months. It's expensive. Um, I, and I learned that the appetite suppression for me didn't show up until I'd been on it for about 10 days, almost two weeks. But it was there, definitely there. So thanks for doing that, uh, Dr. Boz Ratio, Deb uh, Sager. I am going to sign off as Dr. Boz. We will see you next week from 